Hi, it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you to the PhD dissertation defense for Andres Manuel Hernandez. If anyone doesn't know me, I'm Mitch Resnick, uh, head of the Lifelong Kindergarten Group and been the academic advisor for Andres since he arrived here in 2005. Um, actually, when Andres arrived, we were just getting started on what has grown into a large project for our research group, the Scratch Project. And from the very beginning, we knew that one element we wanted with Scratch was to think about the ideas about a community that could share projects with one another. But to be honest, we just had a very vague sense of what that might mean. And Andres, from the time he arrived, really took this idea and really helped bring it to earth and play out what this idea really could mean in the world and really help bring it to life over the last seven years. Um, I think in the work that he's done, he really shows I think some of the best of what uh, happens with Media Lab graduate students. For one thing, I know with the best of all graduate students, you always learn as an advisor, learn as much from the graduate student as they learn from you, and that's certainly the case with Andres. Also, I think he represents what in Media Lab graduate students we look for of cutting across different disciplines. I think when Andres came, we knew that he had a great technology background and was really well suited for implementing the technological infrastructure uh, for the work that he did. But I think one thing we've seen over the time he's been here is his emergence uh, as a social science researcher and really bring together both developing the technology but also studying what happens in the community. And I think it's you know, through this combination where he's been able to make contributions uh, that really make him stand out in the work that he's been doing. So it's great to get a chance to uh, hear from him to talk about his work. Uh, we also have with us today his other committee members, in addition to myself, Rob Miller, who's a professor in electrical engineering and computer science here at MIT. And then joining us remotely uh, on Skype over here is Yohai Benkler uh, from the Berkman Center and Harvard Law School. Uh, I know, you know Andres has worked closely from and benefited greatly from both working with both of his committee members over the years. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to Andres. He'll present for about 45 minutes. We'll then open up for questions, and then after that, Andres will meet uh, alone with the committee to, for uh, final advice on finishing up the dissertation. So with that, I'll hand off to Andres. Okay. Okay. Is the audio okay? okay. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Mitch. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that I've been doing for the past few years. Let me just start my timer here. Um, looking at the Scratch Online community from the perspective of a particular phenomena, uh, remixing. Uh, so first I just want to thank uh, my committee members as well as my collaborators. Um, a lot of the work that I'm presenting today is a result of publications that I've done with uh, some of these people, in particular with uh, Benjamin Makohill, who I collaborated with uh, for a few years. And I also want to thank uh, the Lifelong Kindergarten Group. Uh, a lot of this work wouldn't have been possible uh, without uh, the support from a lot of people over the course of uh, the, f the past few years. Um, so first, I uh, just want to give an overview uh, of what I'm going to talk about today. So first, I'm just going to give a background on you know, what's remixing and why is it important to study. And then I'm going to talk about the particular system that I built, the Scratch Online Community. And then I'm going to talk about three different perspectives around remixing. Uh, first, uh, what is the process of remixing? What are the different types of remixes? Uh, then looking at the conditions under which uh, remixing might flourish. And then looking at the attitudes that people might have uh, towards remixing. And lastly, I just want to you know, summarize and, and give some overview of what I talked. So first, uh, looking at background, uh, so I started looking at remixing uh, uh, with, within Scratch as, as soon as we started developing the, the Scratch community, but uh, I have a long uh, interest in remixing. So I was actually, my mom shared this picture recently uh, on Facebook, uh, and that's me. Uh, and actually, when I was about uh, 11, 12 uh, in middle school, uh, I had my first computer. And this was the very first thing that I remember doing. It came with a Visual Basic, and it came with two games. This was one of my, my favorite ones. Uh, so at the beginning, you will just run it, and that's how you will play with it, by running it in, like, within the development environment. And then I started to, you know, trying to kind of make changes, remix it, by you know, changing the colors, changing some of the parameters. Um, and then I, you know, I also translated it to like, the messages in Spanish and so on. So to me, that was a kind of an introduction to, to programming by actually modifying something that exists already, by changing something that I saw that came with a computer. Uh, and you know, that's how I kind of got started with, with programming. Uh, it turns out that you know, in software engineering, there is uh, a well-recognized um, 
methods for, for doing this kind of software reuse. Uh, one of them, which is kind of closer to what I was doing, is the idea of, uh, you know, they call it opportunistic programming. The idea of, you know, taking code from, you know, discussion forums, or from emails, from tutorials, and, you know, copy pasting kind of, kind of thing. So a lot of us do that, and in fact, this has been uh, more recently recognized uh, as a kind of valid form of software reuse. Because uh, traditionally, software engineering was more focused on uh, what is called component-based software engineering. The idea of you know, using APIs or using libraries uh, as a way to kind of build something in a more systematic way. But these are kind of two ways in which we, we, we can think about remixing in the context of software. Um, but of course, you know, software is not the only thing that uh, is remix. In fact, the word remix comes primarily from, from music. Uh, so this is a song. Let me see if I can play it. Um, this is a song by the Winstons. Uh, it's, it's supposedly uh, the most sample mu song in, in music history. It's a little, you know, five uh, second drum beat. And it has been used in hip hop, uh, in all sorts of uh, songs, as well as in uh, commercials and, you know, videos, movies, etc. And part of it is just that it's, you know, very, uh, very easy to reuse. Uh, but, you know, it's one of the questions, you know, what, what leads some content to be more remixable than others? Um, and obviously, you know, remixing is also uh, part of art uh, for many years, and this is just one example of, you know, that photograph then turned into an Andy Warhol painting, and then more recently, uh, Banksy created his own version with the photo of Kate Moss. Um, but remixing is also, you know, a very uh, important aspect of internet culture. You know, with anything that is digital, remixing becomes a lot easier, so, you know, you have things like YouTube, Flickr, etc., where remixing is actually part of this culture. Um, uh, I was looking at uh, the word remixing in particular and trying to see, you know, when did it become more popular. Uh, so this is from the Google Ngram uh, that they basically scan all these books and then they looked at uh, what, are, what is the frequency of different words. So you can see that in the late uh, 1990s is when actually it takes off and, you know, it's primarily because of, you know, remixing in the music industry as well as remixing in the, you know, in the internet culture kind of thing. Um, so the, one of the questions is whether remixing is a new thing or not. Uh, so, you know, there is some people who argue, like Lev Manovich, for example, who say that, you know, remixing is part of culture. We've been remixing for many years. In fact, the Roman culture was a remix of the Greek culture. Uh, so that's one approach. To it. But, but I think there is something significantly different about remixing uh, with the digital world, which uh, some people also argue. So, like, for example, with, with digital content, you can du duplicate things uh, an unlimited number of times without losing the quality of, wh of what you did. And also, you can actually remix the original source material. So, for example, if I had the, if I were to remix that uh, photo of Marilyn Monroe, if I were to actually use the original photo, then it will be destroyed, and then nobody else could do it. While with digital content, it's born online and is remixed uh, in in that form, uh, using the exact same beats that the producer uh, created. Uh, so, you know, remixing might be uh, a fad, you might think, but in fact, uh, it has been recognized as both an important. Um, uh, you know, way of produ pro uh, pro production of culture, uh, like uh, Henry Jenkins talks about this uh, in, 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 in the framing of the participatory culture, as well as a new form of uh, economic production. So Johai and others have talked about this uh, commons-based peer production. The idea that you can build things uh, online through things like remixing, and that has created an alternative to the market, an alternative to firms where, you know, you have uh, free and open source software as one of the prime examples, or Wikipedia with large, large numbers of people come together and remix each other's work and, you know, create something that the market will traditionally produce. And more recently, uh, Larry, Lassie, Larry Lassie has popularized the term remix culture and he has argued for all the different ways in which uh, the current copyright system might, uh, might not be uh, up to speed to the changes that we've seen. Um, so now I'm going to focus on the Scratch community, which is the system uh, where I studied this. Um, so Scratch is a it's, it's, it's two things. One is it's a website. Um, a website. Uh, this is uh, the front page of the website, and uh, you know there are p people share their video games, animations, interactive art. It's kind of like a YouTube for young programmers. Uh, so on the front page, you can see tons and tons of projects submitted by people from all over the world, uh, and then you know this is how a particular person's profile. Uh, page looks like, you see their, their, their projects, you see their favorite uh, projects from other people, their friends, and you can open up any project there and, uh, and play it on the browser. You don't have to have the authoring environment to, to interact with it. So you can play with it and you can also uh, comment on it and you can also download the project. Um, 
Let me see. Uh, so you can, if you click on, on the link there, uh, you can download the project, and if you have Scratch, then it will you know, open up in the editor, and then you can make changes, and you know, probably if you are interested in remixing, you can remixing, you remix that project within the, the environment. And you know, this is how a project looks like from the inside. You have sprites, which are the characters. You have some code in the form of blocks and, and scripts, like uh, clusters of blocks. Uh, so that's how programming occurs. So you have two you know, elements. You have the, the desktop environment and the website where you share your work. Uh, so when I joined the group, uh, this, is how, uh, this is how the Scratch website looked like. Uh, so it was primarily as a, was a way of you know, releasing content for educators and tutorials, etc. It was not really a place for, for sharing uh, projects yet, primarily because Scratch was not even released. Uh, uh, so you know, I sat down and you know, started thinking about what, in what ways can we make this more like what it, what it was becoming more common, you know, like YouTube or Flickr. They were like about two years old. And so I, I, it was clear to me that we needed something like that where you know, people will be uh, allowed to, to share. Um, so I, I thought about these five different uh, kind of guidelines. And I'm going to focus on, on two of them, uh, the creative socialization um, and the remixing. So one of the things that uh, was also clear to me is that we didn't want to create just a copy of something like, uh, for example, Facebook, for example, or MySpace, which was the thing that was popular back then. Uh, we wanted to kind of have this kind of creative socialization where the community will be not just a, a place to hang out, but also a place to communicate with others uh, as, uh, as creators, uh, communicate through your, your creations. And one way of doing this will be the remixing. Um, so we set, uh, you know, I started to work on prototype. This was the very first prototype uh, that I did. You know, basically what I did was I, I grabbed a homepage of a website called vSocial, which doesn't exist anymore, and I started to modify. I started to remix it and, you know, make changes to, to make it more uh, appropriate for the Scratch community. So I had this kind of uh, static HTML prototype. So I played with that for a, for a few uh, weeks, and then, you know, we started building the actual, the actual website. Uh, this is how the infrastructure of the website looks today. You know, there's a lot of moving components. Um, so since then, uh, there has been more than uh, 34 million unique visitors. 52% uh, of them are outside the United States. Uh, more than half are outside the U.S. Uh, the main countries where people come from are, you know, obviously the U.S., the U.K., Australia, Germany, Brazil, South Korea, Taiwan, and Mexico. They're like the top uh, 10, t top 10 uh, countries. Um, so. Uh, the, the number of people who have registered on the website are about 1 million. It keeps increasing every day. This is a plot of number of new users per month. 30% uh, of those users are people who share content, people who share projects. Uh, and you can see that that uh, percentage has stayed uh, stable over, over time, but also has increased as, as new users come in. Uh, in terms of the demographics of the, of the people, 37% uh, are female. And the median age is 12, 12 years old. Uh, as you can see here in this, I just focus on the main ages that we were interested in, in, in kind of um, supporting, and also the ones that you scratch the most. You can see that between middle school and, and elementary school is when most of the, the, the content, that the, most of the projects ha that, that are being produced are coming from, from those uh, kind of creators. And this is all self-reported data, so people could lie. Uh, but overall, it kind of makes sense based on you know, the kind of interactions that we see and, and the kind of content. Um, in terms of projects, people have submitted more than 2.4 million projects. Uh, uh, there's tons and tons of projects people submit, from very complex ones to very simple ones. And about 28% of them are remixes. And again, this percentage has also stayed somewhat stable over time. This is, the red line is the number of projects, and the purple line is the number of remixes. So you can see that it kind of corresponds throughout the time. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know, uh, could have been the Scratch conference. So we had a conference, uh, the, uh, maybe it was the first conference, was it? No? Okay. Yeah. Maybe Scratch then? Yeah. Yeah. Weird things happen. Um, in terms of the number of lines of code, just to get a sense of uh, what Scratchers have created, uh, it's about 20, uh, 273 million lines of code. And to put that in perspective, uh, if we look at the Linux kernel, for example, it has about uh, 15 million lines of code. Of course, there are different kind of apples and oranges, but just to give you a, an idea, the number of lines of code uh, in the Scratch community are about 18 times the number of lines of code in the Linux kernel. Um, so let me just so skip this. Uh, so now I'm going to focus on process and basically trying to understand how people engage in remixing in, in the Scratch community. Um, 
So I'm going to start with a story uh, that I got from uh, one of the, the, the Scratch community members uh, af uh, after asking in a survey on the website, you know, what is your favorite remixing story? So I'm going to read it to you here. Um, so here it says, you know, when I first started with Scratch, I didn't know much about it or how it worked, so I gave up on it. Uh, then he says, you know, a few years later, I decided to give Scratch another chance. I knew from the start I was going to make games. I was finished but not satisfied. Uh, the movement was choppy and, in my, in my opinion, unacceptable. So I searched the site for per platforming games, uh, and I found a nice one. Uh, at that point, I had no clue what the remixing was, uh, so I planned to just copy the scripts block by block in another project, with credit given, of course. Um, that's when I looked at the top left corner of the Scratch program, and I noticed the share button was still there. And I gave, I gave it a quick look at the scripts and began making my game. I have to say that if it weren't for remixing, I would have never understood velocity or scrolling. It is a tool that makes the Scratch community stand out as a friendlier and more learning-based environment. Um, so this is just one answer from a 14-year-old who responded to a survey. It just gives you an idea of the kind of things, the kind of reasons why people might want to remix. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, has Remix been useful or not, you know, one way of looking at that is based on uh, the number of projects, the number, number of the, the, the projects that are first projects that are Remixes. So about 9% of projects uh, are, 9% uh, of people uh, debuted into the Scratch community. Their very first project is a Remix, and about 25% of all Remixes are among the first five projects that people produce. So, you know, when people get started, some of them use remixing as a way of scaffold and, you know, start to learn the way I kind of learn, as I mentioned, uh, programming. Um, so this is one example of, of, of one of these cases where it was this girl who created this project. Uh, it's, a, it's a monkey that goes around the screen and you have to collect these uh, bananas. And she posted there uh, on the website and she basically, um, you know, just put the, the project there and, you know, complain about some of the bugs uh, in the discussion forums. Uh, so then this other uh, person, so this, so this is the, the kind of the, 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 the trajectory or the different stories around that project. So this is the, the project that the girl uploaded, the jumping monkey. Um, and then, um, let's see, uh, so that's the, the first project. Um, and then this, this user found the project and then he made some simple modifications, he says there. And he added some pink slippers. So basically, he added like these uh, lines, uh, pink lines at the bottom of the of the feet of the monkey, so that it will detect the platforms better. Uh, and then he said, "I needed up the platforms and whatever." Uh, so he shared that kind of new version of the project as a way to, you know, fix some of the bugs and also, you know, make his own his own project. Um, later on, that project was remixed uh, by this other user, the Wiz. And then, you know, he said, "How I made this? I adapted." Uh, the shoe technique from K Doodles, which actually came uh, from from the previous one, but uh, he said from K Doodle, uh, and that's how he made his project. And this project is a lot more uh, sophisticated. It has you know different uh, levels. It has some uh, as you can see some lava lines that you're not supposed to touch. So it became a lot more complicated and more fun to play as well. Um, later on, uh, this 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 user. Uh, Dewey Bears contacted the, the, the previous kid and he said, you know, hey, I wish, uh, I love this uh, game. I was wong wondering if you wouldn't mind me making some changes. Uh, to which uh, he replied, no, no problem, you can go ahead. And then he also said, you know, hey, by the way, if you are interested, you can join my company. Uh, so they created this group they call Company, uh, Super Software Games, and we can start making projects together. And then they went on and made some projects together. And the way they did that was by, you know, sharing an initial version and, you know, brainstorming, and then the other person will download that, remix that, and upload the new version, kind of like a form of ver uh, version control, uh, kind of like Git or SVN in some ways. Uh, so the two of them kind of started to collaborate, and that project, in fact, uh, got a lot of attention. So you can see it has more than 26,000 views. Uh, so it was a very popular game because it's a very good game, actually. It's, very, it's a lot of fun to play, and it's, uh, you know, it's one of those more like Nintendo-looking kind of games that we see in, in Scratch. And that game itself uh, uh, engendered a lot of remixes. You can see all the red circles around are remixes of that game, primarily remixes that are you know, about in changing something small, like changing some of the pictures or some of the sounds, uh, but nonetheless, there's a lot of remixing around that. So connections like that have happened, you know, throughout the, the five years that we've studied the, the website. And some of the people that I mentioned, some of them were in the UK, some of them were in the US, Australia. Uh, so you can see a lot of these connections happen across country, uh, across culture, and sometimes across language because the Scratch environment allows you to easily switch the language uh, of your 
projects. Uh, so this is uh, you know the snapshot of how the connections look like in 2010. Uh, this is how they look in 2011, and then more recently in 2012, you can see there's a lot more cities connected through remixing. So these are two people who are you know, remixing each other's work who live in different locations, and you create a line for that. Uh, so you can see there's lots of connections, primarily between uh, English-speaking countries, but there is also a lot of connections outside that. Um, so trying to understand remixing, uh, I, I wanted to think about a way of kind of creating a taxonomy for you know, dividing these different types of remixes. So in the previous story, I mentioned like different types of remixes from like small changes to like fully you know, redesigning the whole game. So I thought about two kind of dimensions under which we can think about remixing and maybe create some uh, categories. The first one is around originality. So how much of uh, the uh, how much of the remix comes from the previous project, or how, how many changes you had to do to the source project in order to create the remix. So you can think about, for example, the remix and the original project will be the same. And so in that case, you are just duplicating, uh, which sometimes is useful. In the Scratch community, for example, some people use that as a way to you know, broadcast a message and say, you know, if you agree with the following thing, remix, and you know, pass it around. Uh, as w uh, there's also you know, people like the ones I mentioned where they make lots of changes. Uh, and so those, those remixes are very, very different. Uh, in terms of the generativity, the idea there is that we can also think about remixing along the dimension of how uh, many remixes a particular project engenders. So in some cases, you know, there's none. Just the, uh, a project is never remixed. Uh, but in other cases, you know, it's a remix between two people or between you know a group or even between like a, a large number of people. So using those two um, dimensions, we can think about more dis discrete. You know positions in that spectrum. Uh, so, for example, as I mentioned, uh, duplication is one where you just spread the, the the remixing around, all the way to inspirational remixing, where you just see somebody else's work and you just get inspired by it, but you don't really reuse any of the content of that project. Um, so, there are two measures that that we use for for kind of assessing this in a more quantitative way. Uh, the first one is uh, the percentage of reuse. You know, how much of the new project. Uh, comes from the previous project. So that will give you just a percentage. And the other one is uh, what software engineering uses a lot is edit distance. So in traditional uh, ways of using edit distance, it's for comparing strings. So you want to see one string and how many changes you need to do to that string to convert it to another string. So what we did is we grab each one of the blocks as if they were characters in a string, and then trying to see, trying to compute the, the, the amount of changes that you will need to do to convert that uh, project into the remix. Um, so just to give you uh, an idea of an example of an inspirational remix, uh, this is a discussion that I had over uh, chat with one of the community members. And I asked him, you know, can you show me some examples of remixing that, you, that you've been par part of? And he sent me some examples. And one of them, that the one I like the most, I, I was trying to see where the remixing uh, happened. And I, I told him, you know, I'm looking at your code and, uh, and Whimsicals, which is the project on which uh, his project was based on. And it looks uh, very different. I didn't see any resemblance. And then so he responded, uh, let me open it up for a sec. And then said, oh, yeah, I didn't directly copy the code, if that's what you're wondering. But it's based on his code. So then I tried to understand better what was going on. So he kind of, he kind of gave up on explaining on text. And he said, OK, let me send you a file with what I mean. So he sent me that, this, this, this image. And basically, you can see that the code uh, is uh, different, uh, but you can actually see that some of the elements of that piece of code are represented here. Uh, so like, for example, after the if statement, it's a very similar way of detecting uh, the location of the character, I think. Um, so you know, he was basically saying, I didn't grab the code from the other person, but I, I was inspired by it, and I kind of tweaked, tweaked it enough to, so that it will do what I wanted. Uh, so this is the kind of remix that we probably wouldn't be able to detect on uh, automatically on the scratch, because this, if you didn't grab the original code, we wouldn't be able to detect. But it's something that I, I see happening often. Um, this kind of remixing, uh, you can see, how, like, I, one of the things that I wanted to do is to see how much different scripts are reused. So this is kind of like a word cloud in some ways of all the scripts in, in all the projects. And the bigger the image is, the more it is used, the more that particular construct is used. Uh, so one of the, 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 the examples that I noticed and that was interesting was this one here. Um, and I actually couldn't figure it out. So for, for a lot of them, it was easy to tell where it came from. So for example, when green flag click hide is a common thing you will do if you want to start your project and hide a lot of characters. But this one, I was kind of puzzled by it. And I tried to look more into it. And I found examples like this one, for example, where uh, you have when the green flag uh, is clicked, then forever 
you know, set the x position to some number and then multiply it by something. So it turns out that this is a construct that people use a lot when uh, doing scrolling background remixes. Uh, and this is something that one of the community members kind of invented. And then from then on, this idea spread throughout the, the Scratch community. And now is one of the ways uh, in which people, you know, do these kind of games. Um, another example of, of these uh, remixing types, uh, the component-based remix, is where you actually grab some pieces of, of a project, some components of the project. Like in this case, for example, this is one of the this is the source project, and then you can see that the, the remix grabbed some of the characters, like the pine tree, multiply multi by many times, and then the snowball as well. Uh, so this is uh, something that happens often, and that one we we typically do detect because people actually base uh, the remix on on the previous project. So again, I mentioned some of the metrics. So just to give you an idea. Uh, uh, you know, we grab all the remixes, and then we looked at you know how different they are based on percentage uh, difference. Uh, so this is a distribution of of all uh, remixes uh, in based on the percentage of reuse. So about 19% of them are these duplications; they have no modifications, and the median remix is 86% derivative. Uh, so you can get an idea of the the kind of the types of changes people do. And this is just one of the metrics. I'll talk about the next the other metric later on. Uh, for uh, generativity, uh, we can think about different uh, ways of classifying remixes along this axis, uh, but just kind of on one end you have you know, something that I call versioning, which is you know, it's, it's not engendering new projects, but it's actually just different versions of the same project. So you could argue this is not really remix, but it's actually captured as a remix in the community. And then the, on the other end is when you want many people, not just you or your friends, but many people, the crowd in the community, to, to engage in remixing, or when, when even without you wanting to do so, that happens. So I'm going to start with uh, the example of from pair to group. Uh, this is uh, one of the first examples of remixing that we saw. This is a project that uh, a girl from the UK shared, where uh, it basically included a bunch of sprites of you can see people walking. And then in the description of the project, it says something like, you know, here are some simple walking sprites. Each one only has two customs. They're perfect for platform games. If you want a sprite of your own, you can ask uh, on, on my gallery, et cetera. So she was inviting people to, to remix these characters. Uh, so a few days later, this girl kind of connected with her on the comments, and she asked her if she could make a particular sprite for her. And they started to collaborate and send each other uh, back and forth uh, remixes, which then led to the creation of one of the first companies, like the one I mentioned before, that kind of started to build projects together. They started to have like different roles, et cetera. But a lot of the remix, a lot of the ways in which people connected and, and built things together was through, through remixing. Uh, in terms of the crowd-based remixing, this is something that happened more recently, uh, where uh, there is people asking others to remix their project and other characters. So in this case, it's you know, join the boulder run. And this is what the most popular uh, crowd-based remixing that I've seen. Uh, so the idea is just you will download this and add your character to the, to, the, uh, to the animation. And then a few iterations later, you have like tons and tons of characters. So there's like from a uh, mouse to the cat, et cetera. And you can see, you can follow the, the, the line of uh, the provenance line, and you'll see lots of different remixes. Um, so in this case, you know, all, this, all the projects in Scratch that are remixes will show a visualization like this one, where you can traverse through the different you know, iterations and different uh, versions of the remix. Uh, so you can you know, go all the way to the latest one or, or the very beginning one. So this is the, the, uh, the visualization of the previous Crowd remix that I show. This is another one. Um, sorry. Uh, so you can see that there are different topologies. So you know anything from this one, for example, which is uh, one of the current projects on the front page, the ones that are the most remix. This is a coloring contest where somebody says, you know, here is a black and white animation. Please remix and add your color. So you can see that most of the people kind of remix the same project, but they don't remix each other except for that person over there. Uh, there are others that are you know more. Uh, kind of trying to do that, but then somebody goes on and creates a couple of different versions of, of that project. Uh, all, you, know, you can imagine all the different configurations that you, you might see. Um, so in terms of um, generativity, which is the, the, the dimension that I've been talking about so far, um, one of the things that I wanted to see is you know, how generative different projects are and how, diff how uh, generative different people are. So about 13% of the projects in the community have been remixed. I mentioned before that 30% of the projects are remixes, but only 13% of the projects have been remixed. So I wanted to see who those people were and who those projects were. Uh, so I created this, you know, um, 
uh, basically did an uh, uh, in-degree uh, analysis of uh, the network of, of connections. Each one of the, the, the dots is a person. Uh, so a person is connected to somebody else through remixing, uh, kind of like the way the map showed. Uh, so if, for example, a lot of people remix my work, my in-degree value will be really high. Um, and the frequency of that happening, how many people are like that will be on the, on the y-axis. So for example, you can see that only one person uh, has a uh, high in degree value of you know, 10 to the f more than 10 to the 4. Uh, but there is tons of people who will get remix only once, uh, and those are like, the majority of the people. Uh, so I was interested in this to see who are the most generative individuals. Um, so what I found is that, not surprisingly, this one is the Scratch team. So we release a lot of projects as part of the Scratch uh, software. Uh, so uh, a lot of those projects come with Scratch. Obviously, those are the ones that are remix the most. But then I wanted to look at the other person. So that one actually was this person. Um, so it was interesting because this project uh, is a very simple project. And in fact, it's a buggy project. Uh, so the person who shared it says, you know, help. I made my first scrolling game. Um, but I don't understand very, very much about it. And I also looked at what others have said, but I still don't understand. Someone could tell me how to scroll step by step very easily. That will be super helpful. Uh, this is a 14-year-old girl. So you can see that I, I was trying to move with the keyboard, and the character gets stuck on, on the side. So it didn't, it didn't really scroll. She only figured out how to do the keyboard uh, detection. So this other kid who, who actually created a lot of the, the standards for how to do scrolling uh, from Canada, had to be Canadian, very helpful. Um, so he. Uh, <laughs> basically made a change to that project and said, look, this is how you do it. And so you can see that now it's an actual scrolling game where it moves around using the same graphics that she used. And people found this actually really useful because it was the very first example of a scrolling game that was super simple. It was basically stripped down to the minimum. And yes, the images were kind of ugly, but that doesn't matter. In fact, it might be more inviting for you to, to change. Uh, so then people start commenting on that project saying, hey, this is really helpful. So for example, this 13-year-old this says, you know, this helped me create all my scrollers. I have never known how to create a scroller. Uh, you know, thanks a lot. Uh, so that, that project got remixed a lot. And, and, and so you can see projects that are a lot more uh, original, more um, uh, different from, from, the, from the original one. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so you can see this is a kind of more of a Sonic the Hedgehog kind of uh, simulation, and you can, it's an actual full-fledged game. So you, this is the, the visualization of that particular project, the silver key, the original one, and then Archmage, who created the, the modified fixed one. You know, you can see lots of remixes out of, coming out of him. And then, you know, uh, afterwards, the Scratch uh, team used that example as an example for scrolling games. So it was included later on as part of the, the, the sample project. So that also helped, you know, increase the, the number of remixes. Um, so now I want to focus on um, focus on, on the conditions under which uh, remixing might flourish. So I, I mentioned some of the types of remixing uh, and some of the measures on, that we can use to kind of assess remixing. But we wanted to understand also what makes something you know what makes a system and environment more uh, uh, friendly towards remixing. Uh, so that's the reason why I've been using this this flower, this plant thing, is because I think about remixing like gardening in some ways. So you know, you have a plant, which is your project. And if you want this plant to have progeny, you might want to have a kind of good environment, a good system. So you might think about the soil and the fertilizers and so on. But it's kind of a, how likely that flower or that plant is, is, is going to uh, create more, more plants or more kind of have progeny depends both on the quality of the plant as well as the quality of the soil and the environment, et cetera. So thinking about that, that metaphor, uh, a First, I wanted to focus on, on content, you know, trying to understand what kinds of attributes might make a project more likely to be remixed. So there are tons of things that you can imagine. So I focus on three things. The first one is uh, the complexity of the project. So you can imagine that a very, very simple project might not be very likely to be remixed because there's not much to remix. Uh, also, a very complex one is too difficult to understand, so you might not, you know, might not be able to remix. So somewhere in between some will be the, the point where, where that will, will be more likely to happen. Um, the other thing is who the author is. I think one thing that is very important is not, it's not a meritocracy uh, scratch or any online community. In some ways, a lot of the people uh, have become popular because of many reasons, because they're very, very engaged in the community. So the status of the person who made that project plays an important role in how likely a project uh, will be remixed. Um, and the other thing is um, also the, the number of remixes that, th whether that project is a remix or not, will influence the remixing itself. Well, that, that is one of the hypotheses that I had. Um, so the idea is that if something is already a remix, people might find that 
as a kind of a sign of approval in some ways. So in the case of the the color the the crowd based remixing, for example, if you know you see ten people are remixing that, you're like, oh well, I should join that you know that add to the boulder uh, running away from the boulder. Uh, and so one idea was that perhaps uh, whether or not a project is, is a remix might influence the likelihood of it being remixed, kind of the rich get richer kind of thing. Um, so that I call that cumulativeness. So one of the things that we found, we looked at uh, at all the projects uh, in, over the course of a year and looked at uh, these dimensions, uh, the, the, uh, the, the cumulativeness, the status of the author, and, um, and the complexity, and compare that against the two measures that I mentioned before, the generativity, how many remixes a particular project engenders, and the, um, let me just show it, and the uh, originality. So again, what we found was something like this where you know, as I mentioned, the, the more complex a project is, if you go to, the, to this end, the less likely it's to be remixed. If it's too simple, also it's not remixed. Uh, but if you are somewhere in between, that's kind of where the sweet middle spot is. But what is interesting is that this is totally the opposite from originality, where uh, what we found is that, you know, the more complex a project is, um, the more original it will be, the, the remix will be. Uh, also, the more simple the project is, the, 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 the more original it will be, because there's a lot more to add, or the, the complex one, there's a lot more to change. But if you are somewhere in between, the remix will be very simple. So it's kind of like a paradox in some ways. So either you have kind of quantity or quality in, in a way. So either you get lots of remixes because your project is um, medium complexity, but those remixes will be very simple, or you get just a few that are very generative. Uh, so that's along the, the generativity axis and complexity. Uh, in terms of the status of the author, what we found was this, where you know the, the higher status the author is, uh, the more complex the remix, the, the more uh, generative that project will be. Again, I was saying before that if I'm very well known in the community, my project will be remixed a lot. It will be highly generative. But the opposite happens for originality, where you know the, the higher status the, the author is, people might just remix because that person made it, but they don't really change much. They kind of just want to join that kind of group of people or that author's kind of uh, group. Uh, so you have again this kind of. Uh, different effects of, of the status, uh, where either you have a lot based on status or, or kind of small changes based on the same variable. And finally, in terms of cumulativeness, we found the same difference between the two. So, you know, whether a project is a remix or not uh, will influence how, rem how many remixes it will have. So it will be a lot more generative when something is remixed. Uh, it's a remix, but uh, the uh, originality of that it decreases as, as cumulativeness uh, in, uh, increases. So, you know, for example, projects that, like when you see a, a remix of a remix of a remix of a remix will be uh, on this end, and that will be very, the, the amount of changes that people will do are very small. So it's not very generative. Uh, so that's kind of a, a balance that you need to, to figure out. Uh, and as a designer, it's an interesting kind of finding because uh, you say that you're creating a website like YouTube and you might want to have a lot of generativity, you might want to have a lot of remixing going on, you will expect the remixing to be not very original. Uh, the opposite, if you want a lot of uh, original work, then you will expect less uh, generative work. So that's just kind of an interesting paradox of, of remixing. Uh, in terms of the system, um, I wanted to look at different aspects that I thought made uh, remixing a particularly good environment for remixing. One of them was uh, how modular the system was. So as I mentioned before, a project is composed of uh, sprites, which are the different characters in a game. And those sprites have their own components, which are like the sounds, the different kinds of media, as well as the code. And those can come from different sources. So you can see that you can, when you look at a project, you can actually look at all the modules and, and try to play with them and, and uh, decompose them. Uh, however, the Scratch website is focused only on sharing projects. So that's one of the challenges in terms of you know, what I see now as one of the problems with remixing in Scratch is that if you want to remix, you have to remix the whole project, even though you might just want to have a sound or a piece of code. Uh, so actually, what the, and also the, one of the issues is that if you want to kind of use projects as modules and put them together, you cannot really connect projects with one another. They are independent entities. So to address this, actually, the community came to the rescue. And there are two projects that try to address this. And I'm just going to mention briefly. One of them is this project uh, made by one of our Europe's that is basically trying to extend the idea of modularity by allowing projects to be connected to each other. So you can create a, a hyperlink, basically, within a project to jump to another project. Um, so that's one way of addressing that. And then actually, uh, Joran here uh, created a pro, uh, basically a website that will extend uh, originality to have finer granularity. The idea here will be that not only you could share projects, but you could also share 
pieces of code or images or sounds that are particularly well designed for, for Scratch. Uh, so those are two approaches in which this uh, shortcoming uh, was kind of solved by the community. Um, another thing that I think made Scratch particularly good for remixing was the idea of uh, th that you can attribute automatically, and this will allow you to see the connections between a project and its remixing, remixes. So you, under every remix, you will see the name of the person who made it, as well as the name of the person on which that project is based on. Uh, and lastly, there are two things that I think is important in Scratch and other systems, is that the system is very open. So anyone can download any project that they see on the website, and it's all shared on their Creative Commons license. Uh, so just to summarize, in terms of the attributes of a system, uh, you know, broadly speaking, there is uh, the uh, openness, the modularity, and the attributability of the system that will be particularly conducive to remixing. And within modularity, you need to consider you know, how small those, mod those modules are and how easy it is to decompose those modules. And again, also how easy it is to share these different pieces. Um, the last section that I want to talk about is what are the attitudes that people have towards remixing. So I mentioned a lot of the kind of great examples of, of remixing uh, and that happen in the community, but there are also different examples of kind of more negative uh, cases of, of remixing. So in this case, uh, this project was shared by a young member of the community, it's Pac-Man, you can see it's a very well-known game. Uh, and a few weeks later, we got this letter from, from a lawyer from the company Bandai asking to take down this project. And this is a, what is known as a DMCA takedown notice. So any uh, user-generated content website uh, has to register with the government and say, you know, we are a DMCA. We want to be protected by the copyright law, but in order to get that protection, you need to basically set up a way for people to complain and then for you to take down the content. Uh, so we got this letter complaining about a particular project, and you can see that says, you know, uh, while we appreciate the educational nature of your enterprise and look forward to the contributions of the future programmers, your training, part of their education should include the concern for intellectual property for others of others. Uh, so this is a, the classic thing that we've seen in, not only in Scratch, but in many other communities where you know, there is this uh, tension between amateur creators and these large conglomerates that own the content. So that, that's, that's kind of one of the reasons why I was interested in remixing, because I was really passionate about this idea of like, we should change these laws and we should understand better what happens uh, in, in, in these kind of online communities. Well, what, was, what I was not expecting is people to, to behave in this the following way. So you know, these are some examples of comments that, that people have left on remixing remixes, so one of them is like very positive, but then we also saw kids complaining about remixing. So like this kid says something like copycat or hello Mr. Plagiarist, or even more uh, meaner comments like that one, <laughs> where people get really upset when, when their projects are remixed and they don't want other kids to remix their content. So in some ways behaving like these companies, right? Uh, so one of the things that we found is, you know, in the Scratch community, there is a way for you to flag projects and kind of uh, if you consider something inappropriate, you can flag it as inappropriate and it get, if it reaches a certain number of flags, it gets deleted automatically. So actually Amos here is the person who reviews all these flags. So these are about 42,000 flags over the past four, uh, five years. So these are the most common words used by people. So you can expect things like, there is blood, that's bad, or there are bad words and so on. But some of those words are actually about remixing. So things like credit, copied, uh, stolen, you know, take, took, etc. So you can see a lot of people using flagging also as a mechanism to complain about this and actually in some cases basically take down the project because the number of, of flags are too many. In fact, one of the, the, the most uh, flag projects in Scratch ever is this project made by this kid uh, who basically um, he will take people's projects and he will add a Joker card on top of them, kind of defacing them, and say, ha ha ha, these are mine now. Uh, so people were really upset about that, and, and you could see that, that that kind of created a lot of controversy in the community. So the controversy led some people to use these kind of uh, groups or, or companies, as, as people call it, to go against the, the remixers, to go against those who they believe were plagiarists. Uh, so this is an example of one of them. They call themselves the copycat cops, and they go around the community looking for uh, examples of plagiarism and flag them uh, as a group, and they know when they do that, they will kind of take down the project. So we've seen a lot of examples of these kind of vigilant, uh, vigilante kind of groups. Um, so we wanted to understand kind of more uh, systematically what uh, the responses to remixing were. So we looked at all the projects from March 2007 to April 2008, uh, more than a year, and there were about uh, 13,000 projects, uh, 136,000 projects. 
uh, 11,000 of them were remixes. And so we looked at the comments that people, the original creator left on those projects. So not always the original creator will leave a comment, but when they do, which is about 42% of the time, we look at, at, at those comments. And we had two coders to kind of basically look at those comments and assess whether they were positive, negative, or you know, were they hinting plagiarism, et cetera. So what we found is that you know, about 20%, um, 22% of the, of the comments were negative, and 21% were clearly positive. So these are just things, comments that were clearly either positive or negative. The rest you know, were kind of more in between, or you couldn't really understand. So you can see that you know, there is a lot of people who are very positive towards remixing, but there is also a lot of people who are not. And it's about almost the same uh, proportion. Um, so these, uh, actually, we've been getting a lot of uh, emails or, or messages from people in the community on how to address this problem. So one of the community members said something like, you know, maybe uh, downloaded scratch files after being uploaded, but that is when they're remixed, uh, should be marked with the creator's name at the bottom. Uh, so this actually prompted uh, me to add this automatic attribution at the bottom as a way to solve this, this problem. So now under every project, uh, you have these, as I mentioned before, you have the name of the creator and also the name of the person who made the, the source project. Um, so this is a way of kind of addressing this problem. Uh, and we did this uh, kind of a, as a natural experiment in some ways. And we wanted to see how effective this was. So actually what we found is that computers cannot credit. And in fact, one of the things that we saw is that you know, the percentages of uh, these differences between you know, projects on, on this side who have no automatic credit versus projects who have automatic attribution. Um, you, if you look at the vertical axis, you see the percentage of silence, for example, went from 55 to 59. Uh, and you, know, you can see the differences there, but none of these differences were statistically significant. That is, there was not really much change between those projects that had the automatic attribution and those that didn't. Uh, so that we were kind of puzzled by that. Why is it that people really didn't you know, behave differently? Why didn't they react differently when the automatic credit was given? That was kind of my, my, my goal of doing that. So then we started to look at the projects in a more careful way. Uh, so this is one of those projects that got automatic attribution. And, and one of the things that we noticed is that in the project description, people will still say, despite the fact that there is a automatic attribution here, they will still say something like, you know, credit to so and so for you know, the remixing, for letting me remix the whatever project. So they will kind of start to explain kind of manually that they wanted to uh, give credit, even though the, the system was giving credit uh, automatically. So then we coded all those projects and trying to see the presence, the absence or the presence of this manual credit. And that's where we saw actually a difference. So for example, you can see that the, what actually is happening is that those who were silent, once they saw their name, became positive about remixing. So they were like, oh, you know, uh, Amos said that he remixed my project. Then I'm going to say, oh, thanks a lot. That's great. You know, the, my comment as a creator towards the remix that somebody made will be more positive. So, the bottom line was that you know, people really wanted other humans to, to, to give credit. And just to give a, kind of a, an example of the motivations, uh, one of the things that I did is uh, I, I, I asked people, I brought people to the lab, and I, I kind of presented to, to them on paper different examples of remixes. Uh, and so then I showed this kid you know, a particular case where there was no credit given. And I asked him, you know, what do you think about this case? And then um, he said, copies. Mm -hmm. if Green had actually said in the project notes, mm -hmm. this is a remix of Red's project, full credit goes to him, right. then, I, then I would consider it a remix. Mm -hmm. But this is definitely a copy. So you can see that you know, he was basically confirming some of our intuitions that you know, people wanted to see this uh, manual credit. Uh, lastly, I asked him, you know, how would you define remixing? And this is what he said. Give me a definition of remixing. Taking somebody else's project and then doing and then changing a lot of it, then sharing it and giving credit. Mm -hmm. So you can see that you know, he was uh, talking about the, the two issues that I've been talking about before, which is one is you know, how original a remix is, how much changes you made, and as well uh, on also talking about the, the, the idea of you have to give credit um, through the project notes. Um, so just to summarize, um, so what I've been talking about today, the contributions of this work are uh, four, four contributions, four main contributions. The first one is the creation of a system uh, that is out there in the, in, in the world that is being used by a lot of people, that is you know, highly scalable, and that has been released under GPL, actually, and has been uh, reused by other people. So um, this is uh, one of the examples. So we partnered with this uh, um, telecommunications company in Portugal 
took the source code of the, of the Scratch website and then they kind of uh, changed it and they made their own Portuguese version of that. Uh, so, and we've seen a couple of other examples of people doing that. Not as many, but some examples of people reusing the, the code. Uh, the second thing is you know, the creation of an online community. I mean, you, one thing is to create a system, but to have this sense of community is something that uh, you know, was very unclear whether that will happen or not. And I think the way Scratch changed from you know, having the community to not having the community, it went from you know, being only a tool to being a tool with a space, a community where you kind of come to hang out with other creators in kind of like an apprenticeship kind of model. Uh, the third uh, contribution um, is you know, the data. So uh, I'm going to release a lot of this data in an anonymized way. Uh, so I've been collecting you know, for the past five years lots of, lots of data about projects, about the people, et cetera. So we're going to release uh, two main kind of data sets. One is the data set of all the projects and all the, um, all the basically metadata about the project, like how many scripts it has, what scripts it has, et cetera, as well as uh, some information about the users, information that is already public, uh, not information that is private. So one of the, the things here is that, you know, there is a lot of research on social computing projects, but a lot of it is focused primarily on Twitter and and Wikipedia, and you know, one idea behind this is to, to expand that into other uh, communities, and that's part of the reasons why I think the data from Scratch will be useful for, for future researchers. And finally, um, you know, I propose a framework to understand remixing to try to unpack this complex uh, phenomena, which is at the beginning I thought it was just like a remix is either, you know, it's basically just when you take somebody else's content and you, you create a new version of that. But it's actually more and more complex than that, as I explained. So the, the, I presented three different ways in which you can look at remix in three different perspectives. Uh, the first one is process. You know, we created a taxonomy of looking at remixing using these two dimensions of originality and generativity. Then we use that, those dimensions as a way to analyze the conditions under which remixing flourishes. We found what I call the remixing paradox, and this idea that either you get a lot of originality or you get a generativity, but you cannot get both. And then we also looked at the different system attributes uh, based on some on the literature uh, that might be conducive to remixing. And the last thing is, you know, what are the attitudes that people have? And as I mentioned before, it's kind of complicated. You know, some people are in favor, some people are against it. But overall, one of the things that we found is that remixing is both a social and a pragmatic kind of, it serves two functions, a social and a, and a practical function. And, you know, those people who are interested in remixing just for the sake of reusing somebody else's work uh, are doing so in a very different way from those trying to use remixing as a way to connect with others. And sometimes when these two groups of people, you know, traditionally the artists are the ones who are remixing to make connections with others, uh, in the form of contest or so on, uh, are not the same people who are remixing kind of in a more kind of programming uh, fashion way uh, where these two groups sometimes collide and they have different understandings about remixing. And the last thing is, you know, that despite the fact that you can do a lot of things automatically, uh, in the case of credit, you ca computers cannot really give credit. And this is, you know, one of the findings about uh, remixing in particular and, and automation in general. Uh, so with that, I want to open it up for Q&A. Thank you. Do we have some time for questions from the audience? Hi, Andres. Very nice talk. Um, some of my questions are probably going to betray some uh, unfamiliarity with Scratch, so pardon me with that. But. Uh, um, did you have any, um, is there any way in Scratch to track multiple sources? So a single project may not just be a remix of one other project, but multiple projects. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Does the system do that, and were you able to track that in your analysis? It's not really an easy way to do it, because as I mentioned, the people share full projects, and when you download the full project, you basically are remixing on top of that. There are ways in which you can export particular modules, particular sprites and scripts, and then import them, but we don't really capture that information. And that's definitely something, one of the limitations of this work that we are looking at just at remixes of project to project rather than many to one to many. Uh, however, when, when I did that analysis of the scripts, the different scripts that are being reused, that was an attempt to try to do that where, you know, I was not looking at explicit remixes that were found through this kind of watermarking that Scratch does when you download something, but it was just looking at the code of all the projects and trying to see similarities. And for example, that uh, script that I mentioned of the scrolling background is something that I found through that, even though a lot of those projects were not connected through remixing, there was just like that particular script was, you know, the idea that traveled through the network. But so far, that is, uh, I mean, I, that we don't really have data on this kind of more granular kind of connections. Okay, good. Let me ask you a follow-up about then about that uh, 
that scripts only analysis. Did you see any evidence there of people trying to conceal the source of their remix? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, somehow exporting modules and mm -hmm. re-importing them so that Scratch would not have that link back to the original source project. Yeah, definitely. I've seen that. It as if it was their own. Yeah, so there are some people who are uh, trying to use remixing as a way of kind of trolling the community, basically, and going around and doing that. So there are some, not many, but there are some examples of people doing that, mainly for the purpose of hiding and, and trying to me be mean to others and say, you know, I made this by myself. And then people are like, well, that's not really true. And that's part of the emergence of these vigilante groups are because of uh, scenarios like that. Um, and there is also, um, you said that's primarily what has happened. And there's also some people who are kind of the opposite, trying to conceal the code for others to not remix. So there's a whole discussion thread in the, f in the forums of Scratch of people who are explaining to each other how you can create your code so it's not remixable by making it really kind of hard to, like even visually hide it from the screen. Uh, so people share those tricks. And it was interesting because in that discussion thread, there was a interesting back and forth between different members of the community about well, that could be fun, but you know, what, is, what are the implications of that for remixing? Some people say, you know, Scratch is all about remixing. What you're doing is against those, that ethos. So the person who started the thread said, this is the explanation of how you can do it. And at the bottom said something like, well, but I'm really in favor of remixing. And this is just kind of for educational purposes. And, you know, you, you, and these are ex an explanation of how you can circumvent those uh, kind of uh, obfuscation me mechanisms as well. Um, so yeah, we've seen both sides. Okay. Yeah. I have a couple more questions. You talk about the threshold of when something is considered a remix. I was really interested in the quote that you gave where um, one of the users said it has to be a lot of changes for it to be considered a remix. And for example, with the group, the copycat cops, mm -hmm. when do they consider something to be a remix and when is it just a copy of the yeah. project? Exactly. So actually, one thing that I didn't mention, we did a study of you know, the likelihood of a remix, uh, the, the likelihood of a remix to, uh, for getting a flag as inappropriate uh, was very closely related to the visual similarity of the two projects. So a lot of the times, people just go by basically what the first few screens of the project, and they disregard the actual inside of the project, the, the programming code, and so on. And this is part of why I think in the community has been one of the tensions around remixing has been primarily focused on artists or people who are interested in drawing. Uh, so a lot of them are kind of more used to communities like DeviantArt and others where your art is yours and nobody should touch it. Uh, so in those cases, uh, we've seen a lot of tensions around you know people remixing each other's work just the because of the images, they don't really care about the about the code. So I guess the threshold varies depending on the, the creator. If you're an artist, you might be your threshold might be really low, and not only that, but it's very much focused on on the visuals. If you're a programmer, I mean, I'm just generalizing, but if you're a programmer, you're likely to be less concerned about remixing, and you know you you use it more as a as a tool rather than as a way to think like this project represents my identity, therefore you shouldn't touch it. Yeah. I'm curious about. Remixes like is a great thing when you're learning from your peers and building off of something that they left behind. Right. In an example where, uh, d what are your personal feelings about um, un? Well, well let, for example, some code that is doing um, way more than it should potentially, like move ten steps, move ten steps, like a long list of commands as opposed to using a repeat. And something that's maybe uh, code that could be more optimized. Yeah, optimized. Mm -hmm. If something like that was prolific as a remix, what are your thoughts about you know things that go uncaught that are sort of promoting potential Bad programming styles? Yeah, and so it's great for remixing and learning from peers. However, it's also sending something into the community that um, may not be the best starting point for. Right. Um, yeah, I mean that's just one of the challenges with any of these uh, kind of. Like you can see it even in software engineering, where like there are some particular pieces of software that are very popular and you know people reuse a lot, but even a lot of them might not be the most optimal or the best. They just happen to be the most. So for example, one example is uh, Git. Uh, so a lot of people argue that the only reason why Git became popular is because Linux Troubles, the, the creator of Linux, was behind it. And there are like people argue that there were many other options that were much better, but that's the one that people you know started using just because that guy used it. Uh, so that's just the nature of this. And maybe one one approach here is to be more uh, hands-on, and since we control both the programming environment and the kind of 
uh, environment to share, I could imagine doing something where you know you might say yes, this is remixed a lot, but here are other options that you might want to consider that are easier or faster, or whatever. And part of it, you see it in the sample projects. A lot of them are taken from community projects, uh, and then basically uh, Eric actually made a lot of the changes to to strip down the project and, and, and make it a lot simpler and a lot cleaner uh, to kind of spread that this is the right way of doing it. Not the right, but this is an easier way of doing it. Um, and so I think those approaches of being more, to have more intervention might help with, with that. Did you look um, much looking? Did you look um, much at other communities, um, whether offline or online, to see kind of similarities in in remixing culture with creators, especially? Right. Uh, I didn't. I mean, I, one of the interesting things with Scratch is that the kind of people that it attracts, you can clearly trace their kind of uh, related communities because they mention them on the site, or because if you Google search, uh, you know, Scratch, and, and you will find the presence of Scratchers in other communities. So there are two communities in particular where Scratchers are particularly active. One of them is Newgrounds. Uh, so Newgrounds is, if you don't know, it's a website where people share art, uh, vis visual art and you know, paintings, drawings, etc. So in that community, there's a bunch of different subgroups for scratch, uh, scratchers. And in that culture, as I mentioned, a lot of the artists are a lot more protective about their work. And they also have this culture of almost like vigilante, uh, have these groups, so like the vigilante groups, where um, you know, there is a lot of effort within the Debian art community to find those transgressors, those people who they perceive as doing remixing in a bad way. And they go after them. They contact the Debian uh, managers, or they flag them, etc. So I think part of that culture has moved to Scratch as well. And then there's also the culture coming from kind of more game-centric communities, like Newgrounds in particular, where people share Flash games. So there's a lot of kids on Scratch that move to Newgrounds and vice versa. And some of that culture is also transferred to the community, not so much about remixing, but also about the, the kinds of interactions people might have. So a, a lot of the gaming culture is perhaps a little bit more abrasive than the artistic culture. So there are some around culture there as well that they come from just different communities I haven't done any I haven't published anything on that but it's definitely a very interesting area of exploration yeah you said new grounds twice That's oh okay. sorry yeah. um, I'm I'm curious uh, if you saw, similar to there being some connections between the Stretch community and DeviantArt and Newgrounds and things like that, did you see these communities expanding beyond the Scratch website? Maybe they met there, like uh, individual groups that had come together in order to create software and then created these connections that you know went across other social media platforms, et cetera. Maybe they met in person or they would, they would communicate and have friendships and things. I'm just curious about how that community spread beyond cra uh, Scratch. Yeah, I mean, we've seen that happening all the time. And in fact, it's one of the challenges with moderation, and actually Amos probably will tell you a lot more about it, where there's a lot of people who know each other from other spaces, like DeviantArt, Neogrounds, or even like um, the Steam, you know, the video game company has these Steam discussion forums and so on. Um, and a lot of them meet there, and then they come to Scratch, or, or they meet in Scratch, and then they go there. Uh, so there is a lot of context that is missed in the Scratch discussions that then sometimes gets misinterpreted or you know people complain about something to us that happened somewhere else. Uh, so there's definitely a lot of connections between Scratch and other communities. Um, I, you know, again, I haven't done a systematic analysis of all that, but that's definitely something that will be worth uh, studying. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about age. Do you th mm -hmm. think that either because everyone's under 18, right? Or yeah, predominantly well, under 18? Not everyone, but I mean, you can see the primary is from here. Yeah. So do you think either the age of the participants has some relationship with the remix behavior, or do you see even uh, from the younger participants to the older participants within Scratch, that there are differences in attitudes there? Yeah, I, actually, at some point I did an analysis of like age and how that correlates to likelihood of complaining about remixing. And basically, the younger people are the more, in some ways, abrasive, the abrasive there, the more, um, you know, the, the more disruptive they could be also. Like typically, actually, most of the complaints that we get about inappropriate content and, and bad words and so on are from younger members of the community who perhaps don't know as much about like what, how you are supposed to interact in the Scratch community. Uh, and in terms of remixing, I, I, mean, I haven't done again, a systematic analysis, but I think there's definitely um, a tendency that you know, the younger you are, probably the more, uh, the more likely you are of being a transgressor of some of these rules of giving manual credit and so on. Uh, and also about complaining and so on. Uh, we've seen, actually, I remember this example of, of a kid who remixed somebody else's work 
and he was, I think, six or something, a very young kid. And then he compl uh, the, the original author, um, an older kid, maybe around 15 or 16, complained to that kid, and like, hey, why did you do that? This is not OK. And then the six-year-old said, oh, sorry, I'm so young, kind of like, I don't even know what I'm doing. And then, sorry, I, I'm going to do whatever you want to fix that. And then the other kid's like, oh, thank you. Like, you know, that, that's OK. I understand you're young, and you don't understand this. So I, I, we've seen examples of that where you know, people also transfer the kind of the culture of the community to younger members. On a related note, I was wondering if there were sort of primers that were developed in reaction to how people in the community were reacting to other people remixing their projects. So are there things that like the Scratch community has developed to make that process more understandable to new, user, new users of the Scratch community? If we have developed what? Prime? Like primers or... Oh, I see, like, like tutorials and so on? Yeah, it's sort of ways to introduce new members to the community about what the culture of remixing is like. Yeah, or is well it sort of like an experimental, like you start uploading and then you start to realize through comments of the other users what remixing means? On yeah, the I'm kind of related. I try to do an experiment where I will send notifications to people uh, when they, their project got remixed. I will send them something like, congratulations, your project was remixed, or something more neutral, like your project has been remixed, click here, or something like the right thing to do in Scratch is to let people to remix, like a bunch of different messages, <laughs> and trying to see how these different messages perform. Unfortunately, I didn't find any effect of any of these messages. Uh, it could be just the nature of the notifications are too noisy and people don't pay attention to them. Uh, but it was, it was an attempt at ans trying to answer that. It could also be that people just don't read anything that they, we post online and, and kind of like rules. One of the things that we have is that in the Creative Commons license, if you click there, it doesn't take you to the Creative Commons website. It takes you to a page that we wrote where it explains you know, remixing in more kid-friendly ways. Uh, very few people read that. And typically, that only happens when they get you know, banned from the community and they're like, OK, go read that, and this is what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, Yohai has a comment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so there's this kind of things that you identify in the dissertation. The first is the extent to which um, the social aspect of Scratch brings in the uh, uh, Leven Wenger uh, legitimate per per peripheral participation into the uh, Papert constructionism, etc., which you set it out as uh, uh, early on. Uh, and then you have these two pieces one is the sense that remixing actually works with um, moderate complexity more than with either low or high complexity, and you place that in the dissertation in opposition to, uh, uh, say, say Raymond and Zittrain. But then you actually show in the paper with Mako that um, you get a decline in complexity and quality as you increase participation. So can you talk a little bit about how the educational goals that are supported by increasing remixing through legitimate particip peripheral participation, the finding on moderate complexity as increasing remixing, but also the finding that as you increase participants, the kind of contribution becomes more simplistic, like just adding the character. Uh, how those three components uh, influence what you would do going forward with the construction of the system? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I found uh, kind of um, hard to figure out because on the one hand, I think remixing, as I mentioned, serves as a form of scaffolding for people who are you know, learning Scratch or as a way to connect with others. Uh, but it does come with a cost. And you know, even, even actually, if we look at the, 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 the complexity of projects over time, we see a decrease over time in terms of complexity. And you, know, you could argue that maybe part of it is because of all these, like, add your character to the party or whatever. Um, so I think one of the things that I will do in the future uh, is trying to you know, provide different avenues for people to go from the kind of uh, uh, kind of unsophisticated kind of remixing, like they add your character to the boulder running away, whatever, uh, to kind of expose different ways in which that kind of remixing could uh, lead to something more complex or to, you know, one of the things that we found is that a lot of the, the signals for status uh, have driven a lot of the participation in the community. So being 
feature on the front page is one of the kind of strongest signals of status. So I think, you know, without going too far with the extrinsic motivation, I will still think about ways in which, you know, you could support, uh, you, make, you could make more visible the uh, degree to which a remix is more original than, than its source, or how generative that project is, uh, also in regard with, re with relationship to, you know, not only the number of remixes, but also the quality of those remixes. So I think uh, providing signals for that to be recognized will be one way in which you could promote this kind of moving away from the simplistic programming, uh, the simplistic remixing to a more complex one. Uh, the other one is to actually do a lot of, so one of the things that some people in the group have done is, uh, uh, challenges in the community, so like events in the community that invite people to engage in certain activities. So one of those activities could be about, you know, promoting a kind of remixing that is perhaps more conducive to learning more sophisticated parts of Scratch. So one of the ways in which you can assess sophistication of a, of a Scratcher could be, could, is actually the, the diversity of blocks that they've used. So, you know, if you are a kind of person who only uses, you know, two types of blocks, you probably haven't explored the full gamut of what Scratch is about. So maybe you could create some of these uh, challenges or these events where you can um, highlight the idea of, you know, uh, remixing by exploring different uh, blocks or different aspects of Scratch that that person in particular hasn't explored. So I think it's about making visible those things, those markers that you will identify as particularly conducive to more sophisticated remixing. Thanks. Do you have a follow-up? which of the two is, I mean, you're, you answered in terms of how to get more of one or more of the other. Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to think through which is more desirable, in what context, for what purpose? You mean between originality and generativity? Between, the, between achieving a more complex uh, outcomes uh, with the kind of so you have some of these you describe the kid who basically says here's how you do scrolling here's a model you can use it uh, versus the adding the sprites mm -hmm. um, uh, with the snowball with, with the with the boulder All right um, from the perspective of thinking about which is more conducive to computational thinking, to, to, to learning by doing. Have you thought through which of those you prefer so that it may be worth even dialing down mm -hmm. some of the prominence of um, remixing of any kind? I will say, I, think, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, having, for example, the bolder one as long as the other one is not crowded out. And I think the way I see it is that a lot of the people who engage in this kind of simplistic remixing um, is one of the different ways in which they engage in the community. Uh, obviously, there are some people who that's the only thing they do. And again, there, will be, there should be ways of expanding that through more visibility of different signals. But I think uh, the way I will imagine you know, Scratch moving in the future is where you support both of those types of activities. Um, you know, there, is, there is some value in having this connection with others through remixing. It's almost like an enhanced version of commenting or, or connecting through friendships. Uh, it's not necessarily the most sophisticated kind of creation, but it definitely kind of blurs the distinction between making and just kind of commenting and participating, which I think is a good thing. Uh, and uh, and I, I don't think it should go away. I think there should be opportunities for both types of expression to coexist, again, without trying ma making sure that one doesn't crowd out the other one. I think a lot of the projects that I've seen around programming and kids out there uh, either are kind of very focused on the kind of learning a particular concept of programming, disregarding a lot of the reasons why you might want to program, which is, you know, to connect, connect with others, to show off your work and, and make friends and, and so on. Uh, so I think uh, it's important to kind of recognize that as a valid form of participation. Uh, but I, I don't think it should come at the expense of, of the other one. And I think there's opportunities for doing both, to having a hybrid solution. trajectory from less complex to more complex. Uh, I know you have the 
age-related uh, 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 some correlation to uh, complexity, but you have an individual level, uh, any kind of information or even qualitative from you know, the interview work or anything like that about uh, growth at the individual level over time and the complexity of engagement? Yeah, actually, I have one slide, I think. Let me see if I find it. Basically, w one thing that I found, like if you plot the age of the account to the complexity of the project based on scribes and scripts, you see that the older the account is, the more complex the projects are. So, I mean, although correlation is not causation, I, I think it kind of suggests that the longer you engage in the community, uh, the more complex the, your projects might be. And I mean, part of that, I think, could be that you just have more time to explore the scratch and, you know, uh, as well as you're growing older and you probably are more uh, savvy at computing in general. Uh, so I think there is a value in some ways in keeping people in the Scratch community uh, for as long as they kind of still find it a, a, an engaging activity. Uh, uh, I think this kind of initial data suggests that the longer you stay in Scratch, the more you learn or the more complex your projects may be. Go ahead, Juan. But as you're saying, that correlation really doesn't tell you much. Um, uh, and you do have the data to look at the individual no. level at levels of some whatever random selection or some subset uh, of seeing whether per individual account complexity increases over time and in particular per remixers. Right, yeah. Uh, th those are things that in principle the data exists in, yeah. uh, in the system, right? Yeah, definitely, and that's definitely an area of, uh, one of the things that I outlined in the dissertation that I think is a very rich area for future research is, you know, trying to understand to what extent remixing supports uh, different kinds of learning, and there's a lot of educators that talk about, like, copy and paste literacy, and some people talk about it in a kind of positive way, other people talk about it in a negative way, but I think it will be interesting to see from data like this one uh, to to see what the what the effect of remixing is with different creators. Yeah, I was going to ask, trying to tease apart because you were in some ways as you talk about complexity growing over time, you didn't mix that together with learning over time. Right. Uh, how much of a challenge do you think is to tease that apart? Because one could imagine some copy and pasting where you get more and more complex projects as you become more fluent with finding different cliches that work that you bring into your code, but without m a I guess there's certain types of understanding and what understanding comes with it. So just looking, sometimes it's hard to get that just when look at the uh, project. Right. How much of a challenge do you see that? I mean, I think it will be a matter of first looking at the patterns in the data and then probably like drill down and you know interview some of these people or ask them questions about the different understandings of different parts of Scratch and so on. Uh, I think you will actually need to have more of a kind of face-to-face -face interaction with these people to understand to what extent those things that they were remixing they actually understood versus just things that they were copying and pasting from other places. Um, and again, I think that's a super rich area of future research. Yeah. I think so. Oh. Uh, so, so you did an experiment, which you didn't talk about, but, but I know about, where uh, you added a row to the front page for most remixed projects. Mm -hmm. Do you think that sort of increased the number of those, you know, follow the boulder or color in this mm -hmm. sprite thing? And yeah. I guess reflecting on it, you know, do you think that, you know, the net w was that a net win in terms of remixing for learning or was right. it kind of a, a wash? Right. I, I definitely, so I actually looked at the data and I s looked at the height of the tree. So if you look at the remixing tree, um, Th those projects like the add yourself to the boulder will be uh, trees that are with higher, are bigger, uh, are basically higher trees in more levels, right? Uh, and we definitely see an increase of that uh, after the the intervention. Although the increase, it's kind of uh, not very clean because it's um, you see the increase happening regardless, uh, even before that intervention. Uh, but just kind of anecdotally, I do think that it had an effect of making those type of remixing more vis visible. And I would argue that it had a positive effect in the sense that um, it enabled people who perhaps wouldn't consider themselves, uh, you know, particularly uh, capable maybe to program at the beginning and as, as an easy way to get in and to this kind of meme-like culture like you will see in other websites like where, where it's all about adding just a little thing. And I, my hope is that a lot of them probably will kind of go from that to you know, exploring all other aspects of Scratch. And again, that's another area that I think will be really rich for future research just to see, you know, even in like uh, outside Scratch, like how much of people who are into those internet memes, for example, then become, you know, perhaps, you know, more savvy at Photoshop or whatever 
or or how much they that incentivizes uh, their creation in other aspects of the internet participation. Um, definitely a rich area of research, and I think part of that wouldn't come just from the data; it would have to come also from you know talking to people. Yeah. to transition uh, so to the, just the committee discussion. But first I want to sort of thank Andres and thank all of you for coming. Thank you.